Hi, and welcome everybody to this uh, panel discussion this afternoon on the future of education. As we know, over the last 12 months, everything changed for everybody everywhere. Doesn't matter what industry you are in, doesn't matter what geography that you are in, doesn't matter uh, uh, whatever your role was, everything changed. And um, education changed too. Education changed dramatically. I remember it well back in early 2020 when, uh, you know, because uh, my wife actually also works in education and she told me that how the schools were going virtual and we were talking about it within Zoom and we decided to give our software away for free. Um, and, you know, teachers were scrambling to figure out how they were going to teach their students, etc. Uh, so it was a really, really crazy time. Uh, lots have changed since then. I think that we've sort of figured out how to do uh, what I classify as distance teaching, which is different than in-room teaching, and distance learning, which is different to in-person learning. Uh, but we've got a couple of great experts uh, with joining us this morning who are uh, going to uh, talk a little bit to us about sort of what are the learnings that they've had over the last 12 months. And more importantly, uh, what do we see as we go forward into the post-pandemic era? Uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, otherwise I'm going to butcher their backgrounds, their experiences. Um, uh, but one of the things that we're going to do, as well as just introduce ourselves, uh, is also talk a little bit about sort of some of the sort of uh, fun things that happened uh, during the pandemic uh, over the last 12 months. I'm Harry Mosley, I'm the global CIO for Zoom Video Communications. And, uh, uh, when the, when the gym shut, shut down, I couldn't go work out anymore. I couldn't go play squash anymore. So I took up tennis and I uh, tried to learn tennis many years ago and uh, decided that that was a really bad idea because it was a big hole in my racket. And uh, the ball just seemed to go right through my racket. But I've now learned how to play tennis and I'm excited about that. And I've also uh, taken up mountain bike riding because uh, that's a real uh, awesome workout and very exhilarating. So I'll turn it over to Melissa to introduce herself, and then if you could pass it to Henry, and then we'll, we'll get going. Great, thank you, Harry. I'm Melissa Wu, Executive Vice President for Administration and Chief Information Officer at Michigan State University. So the couple of fun things that we picked up over the pandemic is we bought our first set of folding bikes. Although we've been bicyclists, this has been great having folding bikes because you don't have to worry about putting, putting them on a rack Basically, we just throw them in the back of the car and then we can drive to anywhere, set them up and start biking. It's great because we're relatively new to this area and there's a lots of places around here where it's just great for biking. And the other thing that I found out or I discovered was no need bread. If I'd known years ago that I didn't have to get flour all over the kitchen by kneading bread and I could still actually have great loaves of bread, I would have done it years ago. I don't think I ever would have discovered this without the pandemic. Thank you so much, uh, Harry and uh, Melissa. So I'm Henrik Kronqvist. I'm Vice Dean for Graduate Business Programs and Executive Education at Miami Herbert Business School at University of Miami. And a couple of things that I picked up during the pandemic is uh, cooking. I would say um, I, I do enjoy cooking, but you know, there's so many different uh, choices uh, to eat out and you do that a lot in a normal environment, but uh, the pandemic comes and what are you gonna do? You have to figure out how to grill, how to barbecue, how to do all of that good stuff. So probably uh, also enable me to eat a little bit healthier to uh, you know not add as many pounds as I would otherwise have done during the pandemic. Uh, so I, gu I guess there's some good things that come out of this. Yeah, Henrik, it's like, you know, absolutely. It's like biking, you know, uh, Melissa and cooking. Those are things that I have always enjoyed as well. And um, I actually lost 19 pounds during the pandemic, which is, I had to, I had to buy all new shirts and, and stuff because it, it's kind of like everything I had was too big. Okay, so let's get into it. So what are the some of the your thoughts around um, the future of both teaching and both learning in this new sort of, new post-pandemic world. And you know, what do you see as, quote, the downsides, mitigations to those downsides and the potential benefits? First of all, I think online is here to stay uh, in the sense that um, there will be a lot more online teaching going forward. One statistic I uh, um, learned this week from uh, Google in terms of the search 
for one of the degrees that we offer at our school is the Master of Business Administration, MBA. And searching for online is uh, up like 67% year over year, wow. while searching for you know on-campus MBA is still up actually, but about 16%. So the difference between those is, is quite huge. I think online is here to stay. You know, on-campus is here to stay as well. I could hear, I can hear through my uh, office window right now, uh, some of the students that are uh, performing on stage, you know, on our campus where I am today, you know, that that uh, experience being on a, you know, college campus, I think that's here to stay even in the uh, post uh, pandemic world. So not everything will go online. At least that's my view. I very much agree. The students do want that on-campus experience. At the same time, we've discovered so many new avenues of flexibility in how we can teach and how the students can learn. Half of the classrooms that we targeted to switch over to the high flex model at MSU have been converted over and the, the educators have really taken well to it. So I can see that this will allow more flexibility, both online and hybrid, gives more time to the students and gives perhaps more time to educators. And in, in this world where there are people that are working full time while being students and have other commitments on their time, I think this could offer just a, a great new way to bring in new students, new cohorts, but also provide that flexibility that so many people are craving. Yeah, so those are uh, great examples. It's like, you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, sort of in education actually, it's very similar to what I'm hearing in global enterprises, which is, you know, it's, it's gonna be a hybrid model in the future. It's not like, it's not all going to be in person. It's not all going to be virtual. And it's the notion, you know, uh, what many are talking about is like, we will come together when we need to be together, when we need to work together. Henry, it's like, you know, like you were saying, the kids are on stage, you know, doing, uh, doing an event. It's like, you can't do that virtually. So they have to come together to do that. You know, but if they're, if they're listening to a lecture, they don't actually need to be all together. They can, that can be done virtually and then they can do, but if they're working on a project, there will already be periods of times where they need to come together to work on that project, and then they can, uh, then they can go back to quote anywhere to actually do do their own pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And what about you know, sort of, um, you know, one of the one of the things that uh, I've seen over the last uh, twelve months is that, you know, the ability to be able to connect with people sort of uh, globally. You know, sort of it's the notion of the world has become dramatically smaller over the last 12 months. So what are your thoughts around sort of student success rates uh, and also equity and, um, and, the, uh, and access? Uh, what are your thoughts? Because, it's, you know, it's in many parts of the world, you know, they still don't even have electricity, never mind high quality broadband. So some, some thoughts around that. I mean, what, one, one thought on that is that actually COVID has sort of explored some of the inequities, right? Because as you said, not everyone has a state-of-the-art laptop or an, forget about an iPad or some of those very expensive equipments. And then the broadband varies a lot as well. So I think, you know, from a perspective of supporting students with, with scholarship uh, to uh, enable them to have the technology that they need. I mean, that's one of the takeaways that we have had here and really try to support you know, students that may not be able to afford that expensive type of equipment. So I think that is, that is uh, important. On, on your point of, about becoming global, I mean, that's definitely where we have a benefit. I mean, many of our professors, because we're in a business school, we have a lot of guest speakers that may come in from Wall Street, from Wall Street, Wall Street in New York or from Silicon Valley. And, you know, they may travel here before the pandemic and you wanted to have them in the classroom. Now it becomes much more accepted, right, to have them come in through Zoom into a class. It's very easy to set up. And so you can actually bring in speakers from all over the world into the classroom. And, and students want more and more of this experiential learning. They want to meet with people uh, from, from outside of the academic world in addition to their professors. So that has actually been a pretty big plus. And that is here to stay, in my opinion, even after the pandemic has, um, has uh, ceased. I'd see an advantage of using tools like Zoom to be able to record lectures so that students can watch them over and over again, can fast forward to the parts that they get clearly. I mean, that can help with student success because then it isn't just a, a one and done issue if students really need a little more time to think about what the educator has said. 
Another thing that we've done at, at Michigan State University is that we've increased the number of videos that we've captioned and we're using quality captioning to make sure that there's a high level of accuracy. And although you know, this is certainly something for um, access, what some research has also shown is even those who do not have hearing difficulties can benefit from being able to see the captions on screen. So I think it's a win-win. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, those are all uh, great examples. Uh, it's uh, you know it's the ability to be able to pull people in from all over the planet, not just uh, not just people from lecturing, but you know sort of students as well. So you can actually have students participate from different parts of the world as well. So um, quickly moving on to digital transformation, you know, sort of uh, one of my colleagues, Annabelle, talks about digital transformation in the enterprise as like, we're now doing digital transformation 2.0. 1.0 was what could the human do versus what can we get the machine to do? Uh, and digital transformation 2.0 is what do we have to do in person versus what can we now do virtually? So love to sort of get some ideas about what are you guys thinking about in the education space from a transformation perspective. As I mentioned earlier, we, we have converted half of our classrooms to a high flex model and we intend to convert the remaining half. This is gonna provide us flexibility in being able to enroll more students for one thing. So we could have literally uh, basically some students in class and others watching uh, this will also help us, I think, improve our, the learning experience as well, is that using some of these tools ha has really helped with engagement. Although I think initially when we flipped a year ago, we perhaps didn't do such a great job, but we've had a year to actually really be able to understand how to engage students with these tools. It's definitely challenging with a hybrid uh, teaching model. And I think that there's more that we collectively, you know, as uh, representatives of the higher ed industry, we have yet many things to figure out together with, you know, corporations like Zoom, how we can improve on that, because it's not easy to deliver a class, for example, with people both in front of you in the classroom and some people that are also remote. So there's a lot more that we can do there. Now, office hours is something that is very traditional in academia. And there, I think, you know, the tools that we have now have really opened the access because before you had to go to the professor's office, uh, they may be at odd hours, you have to get there, you have to drive there, there's traffic and you have to, uh, to battle all of those elements. Now you just log on to the Zoom and you're right there. Um, and so I think that that is, that is one of the, uh, the benefits. And, you know, one thing that I think we also ought to emphasize is sort of the, the academic continuity that going forward, we will be in a much better space. So in Miami, here we battle at times of the year, we battle hurricanes, right? In uh, East Lansing, you guys will battle snow and ice. And uh, in California, sometimes there are earthquakes. The point is that there are those disruptive events. And, you know, we had a hurricane a couple of years ago here, the university had to shut down for two weeks. I think going forward, that may not have to happen, but we will be able to get back up uh, more quickly. So, you know, I want to uh, sound positive with some of the innovation that comes out of this kind of a hit. Yeah, so those, those are all great examples. The continuity of education, it's not kind of like once and done, it's not now or then. It's like it's a continuum of the education. Love, love how you guys are, you know, sort of, uh, you know, having the uh, teachers, professors sort of engaging with the students. My wife told me the story about how, you know, the um, after school, you know, so the uh, students would normally go and see the teacher, you know, for one-on-one -on -one time, but they can't do that anymore, right? So they're doing that, you know, sort of over Zoom. But what's happening is other students are actually logging onto the Zoom from home while the teacher's having the one-on-one -on -one with the student to listen in on, well, what are the questions that my, my, you know, my, my fellow student is asking and what are the answers because that, that helps me even more. So, uh, so it's, a, it's all, I think that there's a lot of a, a experiential uh, experiences going on. Some of them are gonna be awesome. Some of them will be eh, not so great. And so we'll, we'll chuck on those and we'll accelerate these, so to speak. And uh, so I wanna thank you guys for your time. Um, really enjoyed the conversation. And I uh, hope that, uh, you know, so the vaccines are here accelerating. We heard yesterday that every adult in America is going to be vaccinated by the end of May. So pretty excited about that. You know, here in New York City, things are beginning to open up. You know, we're hearing about Broadway opening up, we're hearing about concerts and 
all sorts of things coming back to life in restaurants and movie theaters. I just hope that we all don't go too fast with this stuff. And um, my ask is that everybody remains safe uh, so we uh, sort of go through the best of this pandemic and uh, look forward to the opportunity one day maybe meeting you in person. How cool would that be? <laughs> On that note, give you a high five. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much.